record on this. Let me click on it. There we are. Welcome to the From the Heart podcast presented by the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses. I'm your host, Ed Hart, and today I'm really excited to have with you a, a, a friend who I've known for a few years, uh, Mark Steinus. I'll get a, a little bit more about Mark here in a moment. Um, Mark and I met, I used to host the Family Business Hall of Fame event at Cal State Fullerton. And one year we had Lindsay Snyder, the president of In-N-Out Burger, and she insisted that we bring in an outside moderator to interview her on stage. And we were all fortunate enough that that person she had in mind was Mark Steinus, who at the time was co-hosting the um, Home and Family show on the Hallmark Channel. And uh, I'd had Mark in my living room many, many times, and he didn't know it because it was through my through the magic of television. But uh, so when Lindsay suggested Mark, we were really thrilled. And Mark was kind enough to invite my wife and her parents and I up to see a filming of Home and Family up there at the studios up in, uh, I want to say Burbank. Sounds right. Don't know if it is, but sounds right. Yep. And yep. Um, so, you know, from that time, we've, you know, Mark and I've had a, a texting friendship more than anything else in touch quite a bit. You may recognize Mark if you're watching. He hosts KTLA's version of the Rose Parade each year with Lisa Gibbons. Uh, he was a host on Entertainment Tonight for, gosh, a decade or so, right? I think you were there, what, 17 yep. years and hosted for about okay. a decade with the iconic Mary Hart. Unfortunately, no relation to Ed Hart that I'm aware of anyway. Um, you'll see Mary, if you ever watch a Dodger game, she still sits right there behind home plate, just about every home game. So uh, Mark uh, worked, again, Hallmark Channel, Home and Family, Entertainment Tonight, um, co-host of the Rose Parade. You've co-hosted so many other shows, Nat Geo, Wilds, Television Event, Animal ER Live. Want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so Mark, it, it's just good to see you, man. I mean, from, from standing yes. up on stage and interviewing Lindsay Snyder at a Cal State Fullerton event, at, you know, seven, eight years ago to now here we are finally on, on Zoom doing this podcast. So welcome. Well, I remember when you first started doing this. What are you, an episode 90? What You're is 92. It? 92. Yeah. Wow. 92. And that was with about a year hiatus. 2022, I switched jobs. My dad passed away. We'd lost my mom. We moved from one house to another. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of life transitions, which you and I are going to talk about a bit here, I think, today. Yeah, um, yeah. Really kind of put a pause on things, but I'm back at it now. And yeah, inching closer to episode 100. Kudos to you. It is so, sometimes it's so difficult just to get an idea to come alive, you know, and see it to, you know, to the birth of it. And then to maintain that uh, for as many episodes as you have. Um I know what it's like to be on the daily grind of trying to, you know, produce and put together interviews and then edit those and turn it around and get it out in time. So hats off. Well, I, I appreciate you're doing that. A great job. Yeah, it wasn't in the script, but thank you for that. And again, the script is I use the term loosely script. I mean, I've got bullet points and things I'd love to talk about and dive into. One of the things I didn't think about, but you alluded to it a bit right there is how do you get up for this every day? I mean, I do a podcast once a week, maybe twice a week. I do it on my schedule. I'm not on the you know, top of the hour, when the clock hits zero, you got to start. We start when we start, we do it when we do it. But how do you do it when you have to be on on stage? You, you're having a, you carry over the things from home or the challenges or the traffic that you were in, go into the studio and then boom, lights are on and you're just on. I know that's probably well, being a professional. It's but. That, that is such a Pandora's box to open it because <laughs> first of all, I remember, you know, working with entertainment tonight, there were some pretty steep challenges working major red carpet events this time of year i i i hide underground i just can't even bring myself to watch most of these award shows anymore because for various reasons i mean they're they're a spectacle um i mean i was i was there before the grammys even had an arrival line like they didn't even have a red carpet or green or purple whatever color it is now um we, when I started at ET, Mary uh, and Bob Gowen at the time, or John Tesh, they didn't even go out to the Oscars. Hmm. Like they, we, they just send correspondents out. Like it has evolved yeah. so much. Such a production now, right? Well, it's that, but it's so, it's, you know, I don't want to say it's like Christmas and it's become commercialized and you forget the real purpose of it, but there's so much on uh, that red carpet and the dresses and the fashion and, uh, you know, the, the, all the critics that have to come in and chime in on who's best dressed and all that stuff. It's wonderful, I guess, on some levels. And it brings a whole second tier to what you're watching because sometimes a four hour broadcast just isn't, you know, what people want to sign up for and, and sit through as Hollywood is well, so well known for patting themselves on the back. 
<laughs> um, and then, you know, we went through the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and what happened with that and how that was, you know, pretty much burned to the ground. And now they're trying to rebuild that. Yeah. Um, with the strike, the Emmys were moved to, to just recently. So things things that were in flux. But but back to what you're saying, getting getting up for it every day. There was a point when I transitioned from Entertainment Tonight, which is, you know, a 30 minute tape show done daily to doing a live two hour show daily with home and family. And you saw when we were there, we were pretty well oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. And I remember before we launched being in bed in the fetal position, just, you know, rocking back and forth going, how, how am I going to talk for two hours every single day? Like what, I don't have that much. I'm not that interesting, you know, huh. well, to be able to do that. And the truth is it, it, it's you have to, to get it off of you and you have to put it on your subject you know they're right. the ones and every day so that's where your really your research comes in like why is this person sitting on our couch and what is interesting about them um we had a couple of um off the top of my head we had a couple of um, interviewees come in or subjects come in one was a was a woman she was a doctor a surgeon who had drowned um and she was underwater for 30 minutes 35 minutes um, clinically dead. And, um, she took us through this whole experience wow. of what it was like. And they gave her one eight minute segment. And I just, in, in our read through, I was like, wait, what? Eight there, minutes we're going to do this. This, this yeah. person died and we're yeah. giving her eight minutes. Right. So I said, I have so many questions. So we threw out a cooking site. I don't know, forget what we did, but we sat down and really, got into the into the brass tacks about her her journey and what it was like because we all want to know so and i'll save the details on that but that was but then we also had another interview come in where this kid came in fitness expert mm -hmm. who had no heartbeat and i was like uh wait what like they're like he has a heart but it's not beating and i'm like I don't, this isn't a computer. How does that now. calculate? Right. And yeah. right. And, uh, and this is where I feel like a lack of uh, producing real skills came into play. So I was able to say, no, we, we have to explore this. And, you know, this was a young man who was a fitness fanatic and he had, to, he lived literally on a battery pack wherever he went, he had to have his batteries plugged in by his bed at night all over. And then we had one last person, um, Nick Wojciech, who I think I'm saying his name correctly, but he was born with no arms and no legs. Mm -hmm. And again, with yeah. one, yeah, with just one um, segment. And I'm like, no, we right. have got this. Is, this is that two hour show you were thinking. Yeah. About, right? And now we're talking about let, let's sit down and talk with him about this because there's so much to overcome. So the point is, is when you have to get up for this is you really want to find what's interesting about the person I'm talking to and what yeah. makes our show. And then also you want to you're you're constantly keeping. I learned this from doing the red carpet at ET. You're always talking to your celebrity, but you're always got one eye to see if there's a bigger name coming. Yeah. Cause you have exactly. to like, you got that earpiece on you. Yeah. Here comes Tom Cruise yeah. and you're like, yeah. Or they're just, yeah. they're just hitting you on the back or producer. And you're like, okay. And you have to like politely excuse them. And there were people who saw the entertainment tonight news flag, you know, that we had on a microphone and man, they just gravitated to that because they knew the numbers were huge and right. We had to, so you had to, you know, have your, your best behavior on and, and try to also see if people knew each other, if they met on the carpet. And so it was, it, it you know, being camera ready for almost three decades is challenging, yeah. but it was, it's, it's something that I, you know, now that I don't do a lot of live TV every year, um, I was just talking about this with Lisa. It's like, you know, we get in the saddle once a year now mm -hmm. to do a two hour live show yeah. and you're like, God, can I still do this? Am I still wired to? And it just comes right back to you, Ed. Like you just, yeah. once you've done it this long, it's just part of your DNA. So, um, you know, and and you got to love what you do. And yeah, I love yeah. what I do. Well, you hit a lot of things that I want to talk on. You, you talked about the woman that you had as a guest. I know you were giving a for example, but when you went into the woman who died for 30 minutes and came back, Lori Ann, my wife is every night, every day, reading different books of near-death experiences and some of these amazing experiences that people have had and the similarities, whether they were born Christian, Hindu, Baptist, atheist, whatever, the similarities in what they're seeing. We could do a show on that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, talking about the, the fitness experts and so forth. By the way, what I didn't mention in the bio is that you're looking at one of People Magazine's sexiest men alive issue. I don't remember what year that was, but that's in the bio as well it was as just um, at the turn of the century, back in the 1900s. Not well, 
from the women who's seen your picture for this podcast, they they thought it was more recent, just so you know, but I'll leave it. Uh, at that. Can and I go then, back just real quick Ed, yeah, on please. that story? Because yeah. now that I know your wife has this interest in it, the, yeah, the, the thing I didn't bring up in it because there was a little bit of detail, but it's so important to mention is, and I forgive me because right now this was sort of a last minute thing. I would have looked up her name. I just yeah. saw her on a special on Netflix, the first part of her, and it was something about life after death. Yeah. But, but she told the story about how when she, passed and she was out of her body having this experience and how she was going to the light and everything she just wanted everything and i kept saying but didn't you miss your family the love you have for your children and your husband and she's like i didn't i didn't that was nothing and she said when i got i just wanted to stay there the lights the colors everything was so inviting and i remember being told i had to go back because my son is going to need me and she came back and after she had the experience she really kind of went into hibernation as far as expressing what her her experiences were to family and friends because she didn't believe it herself she was like this was not about body experience I, I don't know how much of this i believe but i'm supposed to come back and she knew some things but she wasn't sure if it was right and she didn't know if she should say something to her son and it took her a while and she finally finally after much thought she sat down and she put pen to paper and she wrote a book hmm. and she had a deal set up and she turned in the manuscript and one week later, her son was hit and killed um, by a distracted driver. I mean, if he was on a skateboard or his bike, but she told him that's why she came back wow. to basically be there for him. And she struggled with the fact of like, do I tell my son I'm coming back because you're going to die prematurely and I need to be here for you? Yeah. Is that divine intervention? It was this phenomenal story that she shares and the loss of her son. I think she handles it fairly well because she knows where he is and right. she knows that he's in a place that he's been there. All, she's seen it. Yeah. yeah. But it, but to me, that was such a profound experience to have and be able to not only be witness to that storytelling, but to share that with other people. So um, for your wife to have an interest in that, I think yeah, it's, it's been, yeah. And, and she'll, she'll read a lot about it. And we saw a movie not long ago that came out in the studios on the topic. And I think that's what launched her back into this journey. She's had a similar experience that isn't for me to share, but it's been mm -hmm. very profound. And her experience of what she saw was, was um, life-changing for her and for those of us around her and so mm -hmm. for her to read some of these stories that story you just shared sounds familiar i'm pretty sure that she'd tell you oh that was betty or whatever and yeah. probably knows who it is yeah. but it was um, a, just so you know it was a kayaking accident i think they were in south yeah. america or someplace and yeah then I, and then only to have her lose her son shortly thereafter yeah. and then you got to wonder okay now okay god I, I did what you said i came back and now he's gone you know can you, can yeah. you take me with him type of thing that's got to be that's, you know that's what's great about yeah. being a journalist at least yeah. the, what I, my takeaway is is i get to meet the most fascinating people right who inspire me who remind me day in and day out how blessed and gifted i am um to share gratitude to be kind to others because you never know the path that they have walked in yeah. and and that could be somebody you're standing there who just won an Oscar or who oh, just have this big career milestone or Grammy and to be able to see that excitement and in, in how hard they worked for it um, or to the tragedy, the loss. You know, I remember watching, you know, Cher give the eulogy at Sonny Bono's funeral in Palm Springs when he hit the tree and I flew up yeah. to cover that story. And I just, and just the she was so brilliant because you could tell the pain and the depth there. They had such turmoil in their lives, but right. you could tell there was a deep seated love that was still there. She was able to find the humor through the tears mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you see a lot of those and, and um, I've just, even from the Anna Nicole Smith story, like just yep. witnessed all of this stuff, you know um, you know, you, you realize just how blessed, I mean, I have a book in there somewhere, but. You know. Oh yeah, you absolutely do. Well, you have a chapter in there for sure. Cause I've seen it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, for those that don't know, we're working on a book uh, called Boomer Wisdom Lessons for the Next Generation that I'm putting together with 59 other people like myself who are baby boomers. Hard mm -hmm. to believe that Mark would fall into that category, but oh, um, yeah. yeah. So I appreciate that. That's been, that's been really a joy for me. And, you know, I don't consider myself a journalist because I'm a self-proclaimed podcaster. Anybody can plug in a microphone and, and start a podcast and many millions have. 
But as I mentioned at the beginning, your episode number 92, there have been, you know, 88 or 89 guests. Some of those have been solo you know, episodes or or panel type things. But, you know, I've talked to roughly 90 people with 90 different, very unique stories. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll share one. And it was an earlier episode of the podcast. And I can share it openly now because we've aired it and she was okay with it. But one of my guests before I interviewed her, often like you and I have done, we'll have a little pre conference call, if you will, which I'm sure you've done with many people you've mm -hmm. interviewed over the years as well. You want to kind of set the stage and so forth. I asked her, I said, are there any topics that you want me to make sure that we don't, you know, what should we make sure we talk about? But hey, is there anything you want us to avoid as well? And she said, if you mention anything about my dad, I'm going to log out and a Zoom call like this is today. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, I didn't know the story. So we're 40 minutes into the interview. And I, I finally just said, well, you know, and I'm going to probably ask you this question in a few minutes, Mark, as well. So be prepared. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't give me any topics not to talk about. In yeah. fact, you opened it wide open with the email you sent with, hey, we can talk about anything. Sure. But um, I said, you know, have you have you had any challenges in your life that have turned you into the person you are? You're pretty successful in your career, your profession, your industry. And she said, are you talking personal or professional? I said, up to you, however you hear the question. She proceeded to dive into, you know, 15 minutes about her dad and some really, really hard things that he did to her growing up as a child. He was mm -hmm. a pastor and he did some things that no one knew about. And no one in her family knew about these things until the episode aired. And, wow. you know, months went by before she fin I finally had a conversation with her and she goes, you know what? You should air that episode in its entirety exactly the way it is. And that's how some of her family and friends found out. And um, I see her often. We had dinner not long ago. And and um, so, yeah, so you get some some things that that you'd be surprised, even some of the things you sent to me, you know, we can talk about you, you kind of sort of tongue in cheek, jokingly said, you know, some, you know, some of the easy, you know, things in life, you know, and mm -hmm. what was preceded by that for those that didn't see that email was, you know, going through challenges like losing a job, losing loved ones, going through a broken marriage, um, drug addiction, things of those, you know, that, that you and I have both seen and, and maybe some experiences mm -hmm. we both have gone through firsthand. So yes. A lot of places I want to go, and I think I'm just going to stay on this for a minute since we're here right now. When you sure. think about a big challenge, and there's probably many, but if you, Mark, think about a big challenge, again, I'll leave it to you to interpret how you want. Mm. It's formed you into the Mark Stein as you are today, that at the time you were in it said, God, how am I going to do this? And now you look back and say, God, thank you for that. Anything yeah. come to mind? Boy. It's hard to say um, thank you during a challenge, but it's easy to look back, I think, sometimes. It is. No, you're absolutely right. And my hesitation or delay in your in answering it is because they're collectively formed me into who I am today. There is no there has been so many blessings on top of curses <laughs> that I there it's all mishmashed together. And um, you know, uh you know, there's, you know, you, gosh, because there's a loss of my parents, yeah. which happened very closely. Them, um, I, I'll, I'll share this with you because I think this is probably something. This is by far not unique to anybody, um, but my ex-wife was an alcoholic, and as much as we tried, and I've, I've never, I've never really spoken about this before, so. Um, congratulations, Ed. Well, <laughs> how the, no, I don't, I don't look at uh, it that way. I, I also look no. at the power of editing and it, this is your show, not yeah. mine. So whatever you share. No, I, I think the reason why I want to bring it up is because I really feel it's important that people understand that addiction is something that comes in all shapes, forms, and sizes. Absolutely. You know, uh, my ex-wife was a former Miss America mm -hmm. who had it all. Yeah. And it didn't matter. It, it was a, it's a vicious, vicious disease that will tear through a family will tear through a marriage will rip through a person and ultimately led to her demise um and she passed away um from a head injury that she suffered during a fall mm. and it was pretty abrupt but um that was one of the things because when you love somebody so so much and that individual and this i'm sure happens with others who are living with somebody who's struggling with addiction or their child is or are married to or whatever you that love that you can give somebody and provide for someone can be spun around and used on you so quickly in a form where you feel so 
um, betrayed, uh, upset, and hurt, and you lose you lose not only trust but faith in in the human condition, yeah. um, being lied to, to right to your face, um, and then faced with a lot of the potential harm that could be done to other people and being liable for that, uh, i.e. behind the wheel of a car per se. Sure. Um, and, but this is where it turned from horrible to something that I think I can say, I'll say beautiful because when, when we received word that, that my ex-wife, now I've been, I was remarried and, and we had Parker at this point. So my sure. life had already kind of recentered itself in this sort of positive path. And, and that wasn't always smooth in that transition because my ex was very furious about anything that would bring me happiness. Hmm. Um, and that was more of the, the, um, the addiction speaking, but, um, I remember getting the news that she had fallen. She had hit her head. She hadn't lost consciousness, but they took her to the hospital. Um, and they had to perform surgery. Her brain was swelling. So they had to do all the stuff they do to ease that. She never really fully regained consciousness after that. Um, I was open, uh, open dialogue with her parents. I was still am close to, um, her, her dad, because her mom passed six months later, um, she was an only child, but what was really, what, how this transition from being a very sad and tragic, you know, when, when you're dealing with somebody who, who is bringing name calling and doing all sorts of things, you, you learn to distance yourself from them. This is a person that you loved, you married, you started a family with, you got your first house with, yeah. and then you expanded, oh, you have all these memories together. And then now you feel really like left out. So when I found out, I knew that she was failing. Um, I still felt very, very conflicted, but almost at the moment I got word that she passed, I stopped and I had this, I, I knew that I needed to write something because press is going to be coming knocking on our door and I just wanted to be ahead of it. So yeah, this was, can't be a private was, thing in your life. Yeah. Yeah, especially when she had the notoriety and there was a there was a public page for her, you know, people praying for her while she was in the hospital. So I knew the story was out. And I started writing a letter or I started uh, an Instagram post, which I believe is still on my site. And I just wanted to choose the words correctly. I wanted to be, you know, classy about it and and maintain, a you know, just this integrity and dignity that we had when we were both living the right path. And as I was writing that, I was looking for some pictures of her and I found one of her and the boys when they were small. And all of a sudden I felt myself, I won't say fall back in love with her, but I found myself loving her again. Yeah. Because in that moment, I knew she couldn't hurt me anymore. Mm, interesting. Wow. She couldn't, she couldn't inflict harm on me by saying horrible things to me or doing horrible things or telling other people lies about me. Um, I still believe there's some, there's some things within my own, my family that she was close with that they hold against me, which I still don't understand why. Yeah. But, um, um, but what happened in that moment, I not only had that point come in and I was like, I, so now I can look upon our past and have fond memories of it, even though I have painful ones, the real good ones still rise to the surface for me. But as I was sitting at my desk and I was writing this, our little girl comes in mm. and this is going to touch a little bit on, on what we were talking about before, but she was very small at that point. And I'm writing and I'm just like, I want to get this taken care of. And she's like, dad, dad, can I wait? Can I have that? And I'm like, what Parker, just give me a minute. And she kept pointing up to the shelf above. And I was like, what? I just stopped. I go, okay, breathe. What is it you want? She goes, I want that. And I have a couple of Emmys up on the shelf and, and, and I'm like, honey, those are really pointy and they're sharp. Can, can we just wait a minute? And then my wife walks in and she said, what's going on? And I said, I'm just trying to get this, this, this uh, Instagram message out just so it, it, I can address this in public. And she wants something. And she looked at her, she goes, Parker, what do you want? And she goes, I want that. And my wife goes, is this one you want? And she goes, no, that one. She goes, this, no, one more over. And mm. so, and my wife grabbed it and she pulled it off to give it to her. And then we looked at it and it was the one and only Emmy that my wife had won. Wow. And I didn't even know it was in the house. And my daughter wanted that one specifically. Hmm. And I just got chills. I was just yeah, getting it now as you share it. She has no idea what any of that meant. She yeah. just wanted that one and that one specifically. And she wanted me to see it. 
Hmm. And, you know, you know, my wife is a lot like your wife. She's like, you know, children are so close from crossing over that they still connect to the other side. The reason they can't talk for a couple of years or so is they probably tell us too much. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So that, that was sort of this miracle moment that happened with us. Um, you know, a month later, my mom passed. And then six months later, her mom passed and we lost my, my golden. So we talked that we, some of the stuff that I mentioned in the email was there's so much loss that came along with this that we have to work our way through. But that, I think that episode or that transition in my life, which was a, covered about a decade, was one of the mo- most challenging things and the biggest lesson I had to learn. Because when I finally decided I couldn't stay in this marriage, which was hard, I became a single parent. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how I was going to navigate raising two boys on my own, full-time job, long commute both ways and make this happen and not let them fall through the cracks. Yeah. Um, And fortunately, you know, it takes a village, her family, her parents did live down the street. Um, I bought them a house when they first moved out here to help us. So they were there supporting um, and their mom you know, took off and did her thing. Um, and we managed, we managed. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how you can take chance. Thank you for sharing that. I, 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 I'm a very visual person. I see all of it as you're talking, I see the trophies up above you and I see her coming in and, and, um, it's really just the, the imagery is very powerful. So thank you for sharing that story. It reminds me my, our youngest is my niece biologically. She's now 32, a mom, three boys. Um, her biological mom is my sister and my sister is 10, 12 years old. She was born in 72 I was, or she was born in, in 52. I was born in 64. So she's 12 years older than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, she's battled alcohol and drug addiction since she was 18 and she still is. And um, that challenge of my sister going through really deep, dark times, losing her family of five kids, losing her marriage, losing basically everything, and now living in a memory care facility where she really can't do a lot for herself, resulted in this young child that's now our our fourth child, our daughter. I mm-hmm. air quote for those that are listening and don't see my air quotes. Mm-hmm. But you know this this challenge that my sister has been through, that my daughter has been through. I mean, her biological mom, you know, and and um, but it's it's that perspective of of seeing that that. I guess that silver lining in the dark clouds, you know, the dark clouds Mm -hmm. are always going to be there. You know, the dark cloud of what you've went through with your ex and all the challenges and all the things as you alluded to with your family, still sort of seeing things her way and you not really totally understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, there's, there's reason behind the madness, I guess, in everything. And it's easy to see the, 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 the positive that came from that. And certainly in our situation as well. Yeah. How has that experience shaped you i know it's a a sort of a weird question but Mm -hmm. as you go through other challenges now and you've been through a lot um, Mm -hmm. it's funny because i see mark steinus and i see this television personality the golden smile the sexiest man alive the men's fitness you know the you know the emmy awards the et all the things that you do and that's the and that's sort of that glitz of hollywood as you say and i'm pulling a word glitz out of your bio so it's your word or your publicist's word not mine yeah but um there's the person behind all of that that we don't see obviously well, we don't yeah but you know and we don't include that stuff like in no, t- yeah bio it's like yeah exactly know, it's like a resume i'm not going to put all my it. failures on my resume yeah. right otherwise <laughs> why would you look at her all my typos that's why you know you put all the splashy stuff down there so people go ooh and ah but i think the more profound stuff would be uh, for me being a single dad like uh, yeah. uh, two boys i i have when so after I remarried and met Julie, who is just remarkable. Mm-hmm. She's just an incredible woman. Yeah. But my, my youngest son was just leaving. Um, they were going to private school that she was, he was just graduating when Parker was just going into the school. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a sort of a running joke, like, Oh, there's the dad that's been paying private school tuition. For there you go. Almost yeah. a quarter century now. Yeah. Um, or will naming be. a wing of the school after you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just want a brick, <laughs> just put a brick in yeah, there. Just, and, there you go. You know? Um, so having, uh, having her involved in the school, you know, Parker and following kind of in her brother's big, uh, big brother footsteps is it so important. But I think to me, like having that on a resume, being a single parent, raising these children, still holding down the job and look, it doesn't make me a saint. There are so many women out there 
and I'm very much aware of it, who have done this because there's like, I have a, I have a, I'm not going to get into it, but I have a beef about these lame dads that just psh, take off and you don't pay both, child brother. support. Yeah. I'm just like, come on. Man. 100% like, there with you. And, and I see and hats off and pat on the back and all the other accolades I can give to the moms who are packing the lunches, who are making the, the, their social media calendars, not social media, but their social events that they've got going on to keep them busy, to keep them off of, off the screens, um, so much and get them outdoors. It just, it just takes a lot to do yeah. that. We don't have family here. Um, we do now. I mean, Julie's parents eventually moved here um, from back east into the Temecula area. So we do have her family here, but we don't. I don't really have much connection with my family. Yeah. Um, my parents are both um, gone now. I have my brother, who's uh, two and a half years older than I am. Um, we're not super close, um, but I just, you know, I've kind of, you know, the family, the family base is still back in Iowa. Yeah, and we're we're going to take uh, Julie and Parker back. They've never met. My family has never met my wow. wife or my daughter, and she's six. And we've been married now seven years together. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. That's about when we met. I remember when you yeah. were getting married, and I remember when Julie was, you know, with child and all of that great yeah. stuff. So yeah, it seems like yeah. just yesterday in a way. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about your parents. I, I lost my mom in 2017 at 88 years old and my dad in 2021 at 94. So their lives weren't mm. exactly cut short and they were two of my heroes. And, you know, anybody that's followed me on social media or knows me knows that, uh, especially my dad, my mom and I were close, but my dad, there was a bond that mm. uh, was really kind of like any other bond I've ever had in, in this life. Um, talk about your parents and lessons and how they, how they formed you to the man you are today. Yeah, there, I think my brother had a closer relationship with my dad than I did. I was closer to my mom. Yeah. Um, I, I know my parents also tried desperately to have children and couldn't. They finally had my brother. He came along to that. And then <laughs> all of a sudden, two and a half years later, they're like, surprise. And they're like, wait, what? Back to back surprises. So, yeah, yeah. So here I come along. Um, and how would I, I think... You know, I grew up with, you know, my, my dad worked, both of my parents grew up on farms, worked the farm. Um, uh, my, they were hard, hard working people. My mom cleaned houses for a living. She um, at times worked some factory stuff, like working in cafeteria around food and working in restaurants and in the kitchen area. My dad worked at John Deere um, mm -hmm. quite a bit. The, they both, my dad had a sixth grade education and my mom had an eighth grade education. And why I bring that up is you have to understand how it's, it's difficult now raising a child and knowing exactly what you're saying and how you're saying it and how it can form them and shape things down the road. Sure. Um, I'm learning to do that. My wife is helping me process stuff because it's like, well, that's why I was raised and <laughs> that doesn't work anymore. But if you imagine two people whose communication skills were pretty much capped at that level, you know, I would get a lot of times cry and I'll give you something to cry about. Um, right. I never once heard my dad say, I love you, which mm. I carried, you know, the weight of that for a long, long time until I really kind of, you know, when he was failing and, having a chance to, I went in and, and the, in the room shortly before he passed. I mean, he was unconscious, but we, I was able to have a, a one set of conversation with mm -hmm. him. And I was able to tell him, not that I forgave him, but that I understood that, um, you know, he was soon to be in the arms of an angel and that what he did here was the best he could do. It's the same thing I'm trying to do raising my children is like, look, I'm going to make mistakes along the way, but know yeah. that I'm making the best effort that I, I personally know that I can do. Yeah. Um, and that's what he did. Um, and I, I learned quickly that, you know, through some therapy that when my dad would say, cry, I'll give you something to cry about means he was hurting more than I was. So he needed to stop himself hurting. So I'm going to tell you, stop it yeah. because I'm hurting right now. So you got to stop crying. And he would threaten with more violence. So, um, and it never, never hit us. Never, you know, the belt was always on the doorknob. Never yeah. used it, never yeah. used it. Um, but it was always that threat was there. And my mom was, you know, um, 
my dad was a, you know, he was a drinker and he'd come home from John Deere and cut his grass <laughs> seven days a week. You know, he was just loved working yeah. outside in his big acre lot and gardening. They had that sort of thing in common. My mom would get all this food and it never made sense to me, but she would pick strawberries for days and then she would give them to everybody else. Yeah. 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 Hey, what and, about us? Right. Where's yeah. our strawberry pie? Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. I'd be shucking peas and we'd be picking yeah. up potatoes and all of it. But you know, it was just part of that childhood life. I mean, yeah. um, very hard. We used to, a lot of people don't know what detasseling corn is, but if you're in the Midwest, um, you do because it's a summer job and it is a grueling job mm. to have. And we would do that in the summer and we would go out and milk cows and work on the farm, family farm. Um, so those are the relationship with my parents were, was good, but it wasn't. I always knew that uh, the example that my dad set for me was a low bar. And I, uh, two things with like, I don't have a strong relationship with my brother, but I always told my two boys, I said, listen, here's the relationship I have with my brother. Mm -hmm. And I want you guys to have something far better than that. And sure. boy, do they, they are like constantly communicating with, they gel so well, they can't wait to see yeah. each other. They're, you know, I, I, you know, I'll send my brother a, a happy birthday text and be like, Oh, well, thanks. You know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Where'd this come uh, from? Yeah. yeah. I love that with our kids. We have four and I, I love when I, we get word that they've just gone and done something together. My two daughters are here today in the house as we speak. And I could hear them before we went on in the kitchen, laughing and talking they're 33 and 32. And it's just fun to yeah. hear that love and that friendship that the siblings have with each other. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, that brings a lot of joy. You know, we're all products of our upbringing. I mean, you, 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 yeah. you hit on it without saying directly that, but I mean, you know, it's real easy to look at our own lives and think what a victim we are or look at our own parents or those around us and think, wow, they're just horrible or making horrible choices. But they're just doing what they were taught, just like we're just doing what we were taught. And hopefully we're yeah. breaking some chains that need to be broken and continuing others that should continue. So that's, that's a great, it's a great point because I always, I tell my boys be better than me. Yeah. You know, um, they don't like this when I bring it up because every time a birthday comes around, I'm like, guys, I've lived more lives than or more years than I have years to live. And they're like, dad, don't say that. And I said, I know. And I'm not happy to say that, but yeah. you know what? We have fewer suns. I have fewer sunsets left in my life. Yeah. So what I hope for you, I'm at a point now like you, um, I want to pass along the wisdom that I have to make my children make better choices in life, not make mm -hmm. stupid mistakes. Yeah. Um, another thing that goes back to dealing with their mom is we know, we know this through science and things that I have learned that, um, addiction is something that is rooted within your, your DNA. Yeah. And when I look back at, uh, you could probably, I would ch challenge anybody to look back at their family roots and you'll find, you'll find that addiction. It lives somewhere within it. My mother-in-law, my mom, my, uh, my ex-wife's mom, she had, hers was food. Um, the people, a lot of other family members in on that side of the family struggled with alcohol mostly, um, and some drugs, but, um, and, and Leanza was just alcohol. She wasn't a, into a drug situation. Um, my uncle, my mom's brother was an alcoholic, um, and eventually passed away from that. So there's, it's there. And I'm, my concern is educating my boys yeah. to be like, know who you are. I, I can't, I won't ever be like, you're not going to have a drink alcohol and do this. If I do that, they just push it away. They go underground. You don't mm -hmm. see it. They try to hide yeah. it from you. Or it pushes like, them more towards it. It's like, why is dad telling yeah. me this is no good? I better try that. Yeah. Or they just distance themselves from you. And then you're yeah. like, what the hell is going on? And then you find out you're like, oh yeah. man. So we have a really, really open dialogue about it, especially here in California when, you know, marijuana became legalized. Mm -hmm. You know, then it was like, oh, this is legal, you know, yeah. and I'm like, well, I'm, I, you know, I don't have that to put in their face. And be like, right. Yeah. You're breaking yeah. the law. Well, it's not that. Okay. Yeah. Check that one off. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that, that is definitely one of those things that as a parent weighs on my mind to be able to say, look, all I can do is equip you with as much education as I can for you to make the best choices yeah. possible. It's interesting as you're, as you're talking, I, I. I do this sometimes if, if the word hits me when I'm talking to a guest, I've had guests where they're talking and a word pops into my head and other times, mm -hmm. most time it doesn't. 
Uh, I met you when you were hosting the TV show Home and Family. I'm going to emphasize on the word family. You've talked about the good and the bad, but one of the things that I hear from you is just this love of family. So mm-hmm. you came from a, a you know a tough you know tougher than my home, certainly. Mm-hmm. You know my parents were you know college educated, master's degrees, highly professional, highly successful in their careers, taught the value of education. Um, you know, I didn't certainly have a lot of the challenges that you had. I'm pretty close to my siblings for the most part. We have our issues. I'm the youngest of five. Um, yet family, and you've been through, obviously, a divorce. I went through yeah. one early in my 20s as well. Talk about where that love of family, I mean, it'd be so easy for a guy like you to look back. And I don't mean to like make your life look like it was so hard, but I mean, you've you've got this just passion for your for Julie and for your kids mm-hmm. and, you know, how when did that, I guess I'll just say, when did that hit you? He's like, did you ever just lay there? I'm, I'm sure we all do at times just lay there and go, man, I can't believe I have this beautiful wife, these beautiful kids, that love and passion for family. What do you attribute that to? I think what's it's when it's, when it's ripped away from you hmm. is when you, cause it wasn't always there. Cause I didn't have right. a good example. Well, that's what up. I'm sort of alluding to. Yeah. yeah. We had, we had fun family vacations yes. and sort of, um, my dad never wanted to go, but we always kind of <laughs> talked him into taking the RV and driving to Disney World or whatever. Um, and that was sort of like our Clark Griswold. Griswold <laughs> no, was a picture. Um, of but that was, yeah. Um, I think when it when I saw when I saw my family being ripped apart um, from the addiction aspect, um, that made me realize just just how volatile things can be. And how quickly they can go away. And then it was like, okay, I worked, maybe it was fear-based, but I was my goal was to make sure that my boys and we stayed together, huddled as a family, and that we could count on each other and rely and depend on. There was a time, um, and, and this was when Julie came into my life because she really brought a sense of family more so. Her family is so rock solid. That's awesome. Um, like they eat meals together all the time. They just, you know, like they have, that's what they do. They sit down and, and, and we did have that growing up, but because of my travel schedule at ET, we just kind of got away from it. And mm-hmm. so um, having that aspect of it and trying to keep the boys together, I always tried to feed them together, you know, so that when they had food, they had each other. Yeah. Um, I was always trying to get the show for the next day going and get laundries done and make sure they were showered and cleaned up and, mm. and then I would eat last. And, um, um, but I think that is where it came is when there was a real threat to the core. And I knew without, without my family, I tried to hold on to our, our whole nucleus with my wife and it just didn't work, um, as best as you can, because you're defenseless in that point. But after we split, I knew it was, it was, you know, the three of us, I took a, I made a, I had this hanging in my house for a long time, but I took three individual photos, made them, I had a big giant printer, I'm in the photography and I hung yeah. these, this triptych on the wall. And I took a, a series of words that I thought really meant a lot. And I sort of embedded them in a, in a subconscious way within this, the, these pictures of us, like family, trust, love, um, what was, um, oh gosh, there were so many like words that just pop in my head, but they were all there. And, and it's the room where the boys would always sit and watch TV. And I always wanted it in my mind to be just sitting there whispering to them Mm -hmm. these words that if they looked over and they saw it, it would slowly seep into their, their mind as to these are, these are important. And it wasn't until just last year that we took all that down um because we had a house flood <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah, that's right. um but yeah so that to me was so important as a single parent to make sure that i kept these guys on the right track and knew that they belonged yeah so awesome i appreciate that what does the word success mean to you when you think about just generically and then we'll talk maybe about your kids but let's just talk overall when you hear the word success let, let me ask you this are you a success um based on your definition, whatever that is. Yeah, that's a, it's a, such an open-ended, I want to say yes, because mm-hmm. one, I'm alive and I'm well. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that is like your basic cable package plan right there, right? Like <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. that is, you can pull that together. Success for me is what I'm, what I've tried to teach my boys. And this is sort of the, the, 
the easy way of doing it, but I said, find, do something you love. You'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. That was something that they are busy doing. Avery, I think is really close to it. My youngest, my other son is moving in that direction. He just hasn't landed the job, but he, he's mm -hmm. also in sound design and whatnot. So they have found something that they truly love. Um, and I found something kind of by accident that I truly loved. Um, and that to me is what success is. Cause I watched my dad go to work at John mm -hmm. Deere every day, come home yeah. smelling like grease, you know, machinery, iron he had yeah. his fingernails were never clean. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew what I didn't want to yeah. do and I didn't want that. So, um, the thing that's really, I think, interesting is when you define success, you, you, my son just recently told me this. He goes, dad, I remember hearing some interview you did. I think it was Adam Carolla. And you talked about how this was years ago, but you know, I got one son playing football and uh, the others just not quite picking it up on it. And cause I wanted to be, a, I wanted to play pro football, you know, and I had back surgery and knee surgery, all that. My yeah. career ended abruptly and, and it hit me like, wow, he, that was really important to him that he helped fulfill what I thought was success for him. And, yeah. and it was like living out one of my dreams. Sorry, that light's coming in. And I'm no, that's all right. Um, so uh, I'll just move a little closer back up. So um, I, if I were to apply what my dad thought was success, and if I tried to please him and then that, that would be my success is that made my dad happy. My dad wanted me to be a cook, not even a chef. Yeah. He was just like, you, you go out there and be a cook, you know, go get a job and go. Yeah. Go, yeah, yeah. Like just to have a, a job. And I, when I got into television, I, there, I had no mentors. People had no idea what television, what back, especially back then he had no idea. And then they couldn't watch me because I was in a different market. Yeah, so yeah. there was really no way to really see me day in and day out until I got the job at ET. And then, then it was, you know, that's my son. I can see him yeah, on TV. Yeah. Now, now I can see him. Yeah. yeah oh, that's Marcy. pretty cool. My mom was, oh, Marky, that share. She was, you know. And then, oh, that's fun. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. Did that, would, I was going to ask you that question earlier, and you sort of hit it there with Cher and your mom, but was there ever that star that you interviewed? Were you, I mean, probably many times, but one standout that you're like, I, like I, I traveled to Australia years ago, and I was standing at the tip of the Sydney Opera House, and I thought, holy smokes, I'm in a postcard right now. I'm at the Opera House in, in Sydney, yeah. Australia. That was like the first place I, and I've been a lot of places, but that was the first place I went where I was literally in awe of where I was standing or talking with so-and-so. It's like, I can't believe I'm, can't believe I'm talking to Mark Steinus. I mean, seriously, I do yeah. feel that way. But has there been that person or those interviews you've done where it's like, I can't believe I'm yeah. talking to you there. You find yourself in, in, in periods or in places, I should say that you go, how did I get here? Yeah. Like what just happened? <laughs> yeah. um, some of them are tragic and some of them are, are spectacular. Um, you know, the, one of the tragic moments was the Anna Nicole Smith story and chasing that and being the last person to interview her before her demise mm -hmm. 10 days later, wow. and then being on the private jet with Howard K. Stern flying from Florida back to the Bahamas and, and to find out where they were playing hide the baby. That, that whole thing is such mm -hmm. a, that to me is I've been asked to do interviews on that and talk in depth about it. And even the Netflix special had reached out to me and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not there. I, I don't want to discuss that because yeah. I felt like a lot of it was exploitive. However, um, one moment that does come to mind for me, which, which you might be able to understand because before, you know, you've mentioned those few things I did. I was also a sportscaster and I worked mm -hmm. at a local TV market in Springfield, Missouri, and then at KCAL. And so having a chance to, you know, be in that sports community was if I can't play it, I can talk about it. Right. right? So yeah. I was covering the Raiders, which was my team I dated some Raider rats. I had my fun, <laughs> but there was a point when I was uh, in New York for the, I think it was time magazine, 75th anniversary. And we go in and we, um, they let us come in eventually because um, uh, which president came in and I had it all locked down. But anyway, so I'm standing on stage and I'm just, you know, at this point, you're just trying to get sound bites from people. Right. And there's Michael Jordan up there mm -hmm. and there's Muhammad Ali up there. And I'm waiting to get to, you know, I'm trying to get, a, get a hold of the champ to just to get some yeah. response. And as I'm standing there, I get a tap on the shoulder and I turn and it's some a publicist I don't recognize, but they wanted to say, Michael Jordan wants to meet Muhammad Ali. 
and I'm standing there and as these two icons now remember this was years ago when Jordan was yeah their peak of their fame oh my god yeah. like he was yes yeah and I was like yeah. this is crazy to sit here and watch these two people meet for the first time um was nothing nothing came from that moment other than being witness being right there at that moment yeah, yeah of yeah. of being able to watch these two amazing unbelievable human beings greet each other for the first time yeah. of course ali did his thing you know yeah yeah um, that's cool and, yeah that but there I, I could go on there could be yeah. so many others as well but that's that cool. reminds me of a story i just heard about emmett smith and what emmett smith was retiring and certainly hall of fame career and he wanted to reach out to michael jordan and find out you know hey what's it like life after a hall of fame sports career you know i don't really know what yeah. to do and so the long story short is that emmett reached out got some time with mj at the end of their conversation, I don't know if it was a phone call or a lunch or a round of golf. I don't, I don't know the details, but you know, Emmett basically asked Michael Jordan, why did, why did you respond to my call? Why did you, I mean, why did you, were you willing to do this? And Michael basically just said, you'd be surprised how few people ask, you uh, know? And it's like, it got, got me thinking, you know, Hey, why not ask Mark Steinis to be yeah. on my podcast? Why not? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, worst that's going to happen is you guys are just going to say no. Right. But yeah. You know, yeah, MJ didn't get that many people asking him to to spend that time together. So I thought that was pretty cool. You'd be surprised how real I think some yeah. celebrities really are, especially when they when they feel like they know you, they can trust you. That's yeah. the big thing is to have that level of trust with celebrity. Right. Um, and then they let you in. And once they let you in, then you're you're set. Yeah. So you've, you've transitioned, you talked about raised on a farm, you know, the farm life in Iowa, playing college football, um, working local media out there, eventually coming out here. Talk, talk about that word transitions. I mean, what the Transitioning from farm life to media life to Midwest to West Coast to the glitz again, there's that word. Mm -hmm. uh, now you're on Entertainment Tonight. Now you're hosting this show, Home and Family. You're you're calling the Rose Parade. I mean, you've had a pretty yeah. awesome career. A lot of people look at it and go, wow, I want that path. But what were those transitions like when, you know, which of those transitions, I, I guess, felt the biggest to you? Uh, that's a great question. You have, well, um, here's a couple of interesting things. One, going from Springfield, Missouri to getting hired at KCAL, mm -hmm. driving out, bought a brand new Nissan Maxima, drove it out here. What year was that, in. roughly? That was in 91. Okay. So, I got here, there was El Nino going on. Um, there was the um, uh, Rodney King situation that broke. Um, yeah. OJ Simpson was happening. Like all of this stuff was happening. And I was yeah. like, what's happening here? Yeah. What so, have I gotten into? Yeah. So you see a lot of that then. Um, when I, so that, that transition for me was, was really welcoming because in the Midwest, and this is nothing against anybody back home where I'm from, but I mean, like if growing up, if you wore anything other than Levi's, if you had Jordash on or Z Cavarici, whatever, you're right. like, oh, look at the big shot. Whoa, like right. there was a lot big of big city boy. Yeah. 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 So uh coming out here, everything was different, starting with the trees. And I just mm -hmm. went like, wow. And I remember going down Venice Beach going, I can be anybody I want and nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody's going to judge me for, and so that's when I really started to, I think, blossom and find really my true spirit, I guess. Um, I ended up in a weird backward way doing a story that led me to do firewalks. So hmm. I was down at, yeah, um, at Lighthouse um, was this place and um, John Craig and uh, Tom Craig and John Labriolo were the two that reached out to me and said, Hey, come on down. And we walk on fire. And I'm like, Oh, you mean like broken glass and, you know, laying on a bed of nails. Like I was, yeah. I thought it was some circus freak thing yeah. that that was very transformative for me. Um, but this was a really, this is what will go in my book one day is so my wife, uh, my ex-wife, uh, former wife, Leanza was Miss America 93. I think we met during her year and then we got married in 95 and we were on our honeymoon in Hawaii. And I was, a, I was a sportscaster at the time, but I'd gone through Groundlings Improv. I'd studied Meisner acting and I was going to leave and go down the road and pursue an acting career. And we were going to live on her salary. So while we're there, I get a phone call saying, hey, my agent calls and says, hey, E.T. found out that you left your sportscasting job. Would you be interested? Hmm. 
And I was like, oh, do I want to work with my wife? And I remember thinking Regis and, and his wife worked together a little bit. I feel yeah. like, oh, maybe we could do that. Maybe one day we would grow into a husband. It's a family show kind of feel. Sure. So we came back from our honeymoon. I went in an audition and I took her job. Hmm. And they hired me and they brought me in. After I did my audition thing, they brought me into one building and sat me down. And they, meanwhile, unbeknownst to me, they took her into the the executive producer's office and they released her wow. and just didn't renew her contract. And then they told me, welcome to the team. And everything was light and fun and everything is great. And they <laughs> said, now sit down for a second. Um, we're not going to pick up, you know, your wife's contract. And I was like, what? <laughs> so it was a little bit of a brutal transition. When yeah. You, I would imagine you know, That'd be tough. a week after your honeymoon and coming home. And then all of a sudden, you know, she's unemployed. Um, um, she did go on to find some work after that. Cause she was really she was a brilliant on camera personality. She, I've never seen anybody memorize copy so much like she could. She was mm. super smart, but um, that was a transition. That yeah. was one that yeah. was difficult. Um, sure. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. When you look back at what you've accomplished in your career, um, I hate the word pride, but I'm going to use it anyway. Mm. What are you most proud of? Whether it's a specific um, job or just in general. No, I think what I'm most proud, that's a really good question, Ed. I think, and because it plays into exactly what I've been told, advice I was given when I left um, Channel 7 in Waterloo, Katie did really well. We had a going away party when I moved to Springfield, Missouri. And Tammy Weinsack uh, pulled me aside. She was one of our reporters. And she said, she said, the reason you got this job and the reason why you're moving up is because of who you are. Hmm. Don't ever change that. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that because that that message has been ingrained in me. And when, so yes, I grow as an individual, but it's that kindness, that generosity, that being trustworthy, having a good moral compass, yeah. um, all of those things that, you know, there can be so many traps set in this town, as you, as a lot of people can tell you, sure. and trying to avoid those and staying out of those. Um, I, I feel like that to me is one of the biggest accomplishments because a lot of feedback that I will get is people will say, you're, you know, you know, I've told my client, you're not going to find a better person to interview you, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. And that to me is something that I really, really take a lot of pride in. Yeah. Is having no, that's that. awesome. Yeah. And I saw that just the time that we were up at the studio watching you host home and family. I mean, I saw you on camera and off and you're just, you know, what you see is what you get. And when you're up on stage interviewing Lindsay Snyder and I don't remember what the situation was, but I was thinking about this the other day, something technical was happening where you had to vamp a little bit. And I remember turning to the people at my table thing, saying, I'm so glad it's him because if I was the one up there, I wouldn't have known what to do, but you're such the, the professional and you've, you know, you've, you've had technical things happen all the time in your role. I'm sure you have, you know, hosting for, you know, a couple of decades, there had to be times when you thought the camera was on and it wasn't, or it was on and you didn't think it was, or somebody didn't show and you have to improvise and you, you, and your, your background in acting and everything probably taught you a thing or two about improvisation too. So, yeah. Yeah. It, look, you, the, the audience is always watching, you know, yeah. when I, this was a tough part when, when I was going through the struggles here at home in this very house, hmm. um, I would have to go to work and know the camera doesn't blink. And if you show anything that it's something's going to be like, what's wrong yeah. with him? He's not, he's not himself. So, you know, it took therapy, but I took a lot of those feelings <laughs> and shoved them down inside because I yeah. could not risk letting them surface and come out. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was a, a big challenge. So professionally, what's exciting for you out in the, uh, on the horizon? I, uh, I have created a couple of shows that, you know, it's hard to convince other people to believe in your concepts, but I have, uh, a producing partner and I started a show, um, plowed through, uh, probably I think now 65 books. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's origins. It's why we do and say the things that we say, and we have no clue. Wow. Um, for, I'll give you a quick example. I know and it's a game show. Um, but cool. it, like we say, put a pin in it, right? You say, look, let's put a pin in that. Let's well, a lot of people don't know the origin of that phrase is putting a pin back in a hand grenade. So, um, you know, and, yeah. or if you tell somebody that's a piece of cake can or, of corn, or, or, or yeah. a cakewalk, that's, yeah. uh, that's a racist comment because mm. 
slaves or those who were, you know, held as slaves used to dress up and and mock and and dance the way their owners would. And their mm. owners saw this and they thought, oh, this is flattery. And they would reward them with cake or pieces of cake. Wow. Um, so there's there's everything from grandfathered in as a racist comment, but even to like products that we have, what's the WD and WD-40 stand for? Um, why does mm. Subway have arrows pointed at the end? Yeah. Why is there, if you look at this and I, you don't notice these things, but they're everywhere. Like 7-Eleven has this lowercase n at the very end of the 11. Hmm. Why is that the case? Why is a stop sign shaped the way it's shaped? There's a story behind all of these things. Love it. Um, and so I've done the research research for so much of these things. Like why, there's a whole interesting story behind the, why do we slip on a banana peel? You know, we all we know was like, oh, we slipped on a banana peel. Yeah. It's a joke. Uh -huh. That's because we saw it on Bugs Bunny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a, there is a re very rich story and it has to do with the, it was told on the Academy Awards, actually. I love so it. So I have that. I have a show that I'm working on and just started developing called, it's a kid's show called um, uh, um, Oops to Art. And it's helping kids understand that they don't make mistakes or they can make mistakes, but of those mistakes, we can find beauty in those and we can turn them into something else. So wow. it's as simple as drawing a squiggly line and then having Parker draw something from it. Yeah. So we're working on that and uh, I'm launching my photography career this year or my photography yeah. business doing headshots. Cause I think it's time to take what I've learned in front of a camera, take my love and passion behind the camera and work with individuals and help create images. When you're very, very artistic that way, I've, over the years, I've seen a lot of the work that you've done and it's, it's pretty spectacular. So Thank I'll you. share if you'd like, if there's a link or anything to any of that, I'd love to share that. Still working on the website, but I'll send it to you. Yeah. I'll okay. send it to yeah. you. And, love to and, promote and, that. Um, and, and then just being a dad, like I said to you before we started this, I spent the day, a good portion of the day with my daughter down at Venice Beach with yeah. roller skates on, you know, and, you know, we're the same age. So yeah. having, you know, you talk about transition, it's like a lot of my friends are with the empty nest, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you got 30 year olds outside talking, right? Right. Well, I have a six year old yeah. who wants to watch another episode of Barbie. There you and, go. And yep. I miss the I miss the yep. Patriots. Oh, I watch a lot of Bluey and uh, Peppa Pig in this house with grandkids. So yeah, yeah that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, I'm not ready for grandkids. I told my boys, I'm like, if you have grandkids, don't bring them around here. I still got to raise mine. Dude, we have nine, nine boys. Oh my God. I got my oh. I got my next my next Dodger team. I got we got nine boys, ages twelve down to almost two oh. months. Wow, all boys, yeah. all boys. Yeah, it's what, of, the, of the five of your siblings. What are, what's the what's the ratio of boys? So of the five, I'm the youngest of three boys. So I have two older brothers, two older sisters, and then my wife and I have two girls and two boys. The boys are um, 39 and 37, and the girls are 33 and 32. Oh. And then um, oldest son Justin has four boys. Sorry, everybody, we're just gonna go personal here for me. <laughs> Look at your go go uh, check an email or something while yeah. Mark and Mark and I catch up. Yeah, no, because I have a follow up to this because I need to know as someone who's got kids in their twenties. Yeah, and and for others who are out there who may be parents, do you ever stop worrying about your kids? That's a great question, and no. Yeah. Um, the word I've I've often I've talked to several friends who are also grandparents, grandpas in particular, friends of mine, and what we talk about is the difference between the worry as a parent versus the worry as a grandparent is, you know, the worry as a parent is worrying literally about everything. And a lot of the worry is self-imposed worry. How am I going to, how am I going to support? How am I going to raise? Yeah. Oftentimes I worry now, how are my kids going to raise their kids? Cause I don't know if yeah. I taught them that or not. Just trying to adjust this um, to the and, and, you know, we love them. And then, you know, the old, you know, love them, spoil them, feed them with sugar and then pass them back to their parents is yeah. a lot of truth to that. But yeah. Uh, you know, the yeah. worries there, you know, I, I worry about this world that we're in now. It's a tougher world today than it was when we were raising kids. We didn't yeah. have, you know, everybody has, you talked about how the camera is always on, you know, we all yeah. have this cell phone. That's a video all the time or access to things. We don't want people to, you know, our kids and grandkids to access, but just love them, love them and teach them and hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Cause I sit and I look at that and I'm like, Oh God, I just, it's like you go to bed at night and you just worry, yeah. you know, not overly worried, but like, Oh, I hope he gets a job soon. And Oh, I hope it's something he likes. And I right. know oh, it's this. And, yeah. and you just want to be there and be a good listener. You know, my wife has raised monarch butterflies for a few years and um, I love the, the um, analogy, I guess, for lack of a better word of, you know, you, you really want to clip the butterfly out of that cocoon when it's struggling, but you know, you can't cause it'll die. Just like with our yeah. kids, we want to pave the way and make things easier for them. But 
you know, to my question at the beginning of this interview, you know, that the challenges are what form us, you know, we are who we are because of the challenges and the struggles we've had. I'm so much more grateful for the hard times in my life now than I was when I was going through them. And I'm really more grateful for the hard times in my life now than I am for the good times in my life, because yeah, I'm, I'm glad I've had blessings and I'm glad I've had a really good life and I've been very blessed, but the challenges have, have, have strengthened me. It's just like you, you know, you go to the gym, you tear down your, your body only to build it up. I say yeah. you, cause you know, I don't go to the gym like you do, but, uh, well, but you know what, I, I will say there's something good about social media because I've picked up so many great anecdotes about, you know, my dad walked every day the thing and then he rode a right. bike and then he had a car and then I have a Ferrari and then da da da. And then yeah. his kid's going to end up walking again because, you know, the saying is tough times make strong men and mm -hmm. weak times make weak men. And, and you go through that and, and, yeah. you know, having those difficult times. And I do look at my kids and I go, am I giving them too much? Right. Am I providing yeah. too much? Yeah. Um, and it comes down to, then it's tough love. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my friend, we've covered a lot and I can't believe it's already been an hour. Um, I hope that we can continue this. I appreciate you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that, you know, I, there are few people in this world that when we reach out, we, they know that we know they're going to reach back and you're one of those. And I've always appreciated yes. that about you. I know you have a lot on your plate and a lot going on as, as we all do, but it's always nice to know there's somebody on the other end of that. You send a text and it says red. And then within seconds, there's usually some sort of response back. So yeah, I try to, especially when I get your texts, just to no, I appreciate up. that you're, you're I, a man I, and become a good friend. So likewise, likewise, yeah. and we're uh, of the same generation. And yeah. I think having, um, having those experiences and having those good friends that yeah. are of your caliber is so important to have. It and is. I'm trying it to is. teach that to, to my boys is find people who uplift you and hold you in that high regard yeah. and you'll be okay. You know, appreciate that kind words. Thank you. What's the best way if someone wants to connect with you or reach you, uh, you talk about social media. Is there a, is there yeah. a better way than another to. Uh, no, I mean, I I'm typically on Instagram more than I am Facebook. Um, I'm not really a Twitter or X person. Um, so really the, my main is, is, uh, Instagram, which is just at Mark Steinus. Yeah. Um, and I do have a public page, same name on, on Facebook. I try to, I try to respond as much as I can, but sometimes it's, I find myself, it's a diminishing return. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah. um, but I will say this 99% of the people who do follow me are, positive every once in a while yeah. i'll find somebody with keyboard courage and i just block them and keyboard just like courage, oh, yeah yeah i just yeah. can't I, there's no space in my world for that i i if i disagree with somebody on something i if it's a friend i may send them a private note saying hey i respect your differences i don't necessarily agree with you but yeah but go for it you know um but when some people just start going off and you're like wow so um, but yeah, I, I don't have a huge following, but I do have people that are so supportive and I do the same in return. Awesome. So. Well, as I tell all my guests, and I told you at the outset, the name of the podcast is from the heart, uh, partially because my last name is heart, but also more importantly, because I really like to get to the heart, which I think we've done this last hour of who Mark Steinus is. Um, so a little bit redundant, but I'm going to ask it anyway, before we go, uh -huh. as we finish up Mark Steinus, what's in your heart? Mm. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I will use a quote that I learned from my son when he was three years old. And I said, I was testing him. I said, Avery, do you know what love is? And he said, sure. And I said, can you tell me? Cause I'm a grown up, and sometimes I forget and I'll never forget this. And this has always stayed with me. He said, love is when your heart hurts good. And that's what's in my heart. It hurts good. It, wow. it may hurt because I disagree with my son or daughter or something, whatever. But it, I know when it's hurting, it's because it's a love feeling that I'm having. That if if I didn't care, it wouldn't hurt. So love is, it's what's in my heart is when love hurts, it hurts good. <laughs>